Hi, Ann Claire. Hi, Meg. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I'm so curious. What do we have planned to talk about today? So today, we're going to do sort of follow-up on a video from a little while back when we talked about fear of weight gain. And today, we're going to explore three more common reasons why someone might not really want to recover. Hmm. So true. It's really important for all the listeners or the viewers here to really check in with their resistance, right? And here we just kind of want to call out maybe some of the most common reasons why people are kind of stuck and they don't, or maybe they feel apathetic towards it because they're, Mm -hmm. you might have some really valid reasons why you don't want to recover. So the first one, which I find to be very common is I don't know who I am without my eating disorder. And if we look at that little point of resistance, it comes down to a lot of identifying with being sick often or identifying with being the healthy one in quotes. And we can also take it to sometimes perhaps having the eating disorder gives that person, right? It is serving them by giving that person a sense of identity or a sense of even life purpose. And so if that person were to recover, they would be left without an identity or a purpose. And it might cause a lot of fear because like a loss of identity is hard to deal with. So that is the first one. I mean, a lot of what you just said makes so much sense. Like this thing where when we have an eating disorder, we feel special and unique. And then the one thing that I wanted to add on top of that is how much like the nature of eating disorders disconnects us from like our core self. Mm -hmm. And so we can really sort of end up feeling a bit like lost in terms of, well, but if I remove this layer, right, that drives me, that determines so many of my choices. And maybe it's been a long time, right, that I've been suffering from an eating disorder. So I don't even remember who I was before I had an eating disorder. I don't know what I actually like. I don't know where I'm going. Maybe I'm questioning, you know, the things that I'm studying or, you know, my friends or my hobbies and everything. And it can be really confusing. But at the same time, I want to insist that part of the recovery like journey is about simply re-exploring, rediscovering, redefining who you always were, who you want to become. And that comes with the process of. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so if this is something that you sort of like hear inside of yourself, like, yeah, but I don't know who I am without my eating disorder, please know that actually you're going to figure that out as you go. You don't have to know when you start doing the work, oh, this is exactly who I want to be. (laughs) Like, (laughs) here's like this picture of who I am going to become at the end of this process. Because, well, even if you have one, honestly, I expect it to slightly change. (laughs) Because usually I see clients like rediscovering a lot about who they are and adding layers to that. And that makes so much sense. So we understand it can't make sense. And this is something that you will be guided through by your treatment team. Mm, Yes. I love that point. It is a slow becoming and it's not as scary as you might think because the things that are connected to your authentic self start to naturally show up and you might like having a nourished brain, for instance, may bring back old characteristics or personality traits that you have lost. It's just a really beautiful process. And if you can start looking at it with a sense of like awe and amazement instead of fear might be helpful. Although we do validate how hard it is and it is scary to live life without that life raft. And so, you know, this is so much easier said than done, but trusting the process and trusting people have been through this where, you know, that eating disorder took up so much space as your identity and your worth, but then, you know, we have both recovered and we're able to find our identities pretty naturally over time. 
So that is number one. Number two is something along the lines of, I don't want to feel my emotions. <laughs> so this is something that might typically like show up as like, ugh, but then when I don't use behaviors, I end up with all of these thoughts or all of these things. Maybe you can't even name the emotions, but it's just uncomfortable and icky and yucky. And then it's like, Wah, like I have to use behaviors because I can't be with myself. I can't be with my thoughts. I can't be with my emotions. And again, this is so typical. This is really like down to those functions, right? Of that eating disorder. Like we're going to see that so often. Like, oh, I use behaviors to avoid my emotions. I use behaviors to numb out. I use my emotions to cope with sadness or grief because I don't know how else to do it. Or I'm filling up on emptiness. Like this feeling of emptiness is so scary that I'm using food to do that job. And so again, well, I'm going to put my hand up and say like, emotions were my kryptonite in recovery. Like I could not even name things, right? I like my emotional vocabulary was probably limited to three words, like good, <laughs> bad, whatever, <laughs> fine. <laughs> and it was scary, right? And it was an entire exploration, but finally putting that into words, right? This, oh, but what is so hard right now, like the reason I don't want to let go of this behavior is because then I have to sit with this thing and I'm not sure how was like really open doors to options in terms of trying out things and and doing healing work. Mm. Yeah, whenever I get a, a client who says, I just don't want to feel the emotions, I always basically chuckle a little because I'm like, I've definitely been there. And like almost everybody with an eating disorder is on the same boat. Like a huge reason or a huge way why your eating disorder serves you is because it helps you avoid feeling the tough feelings. And I just want to encourage the people watching who say it is a difficult process, but it's also a really unique way to learn a lot about yourself. And when you can start building up your own emotional intelligence, you are equipped to, you are better equipped to take care of yourself and ask yourself the question, what do I need? So if you can identify that you're feeling hurt or um, disappointed, you know, the next question might be like, what can I do right now to take care of myself? As opposed to, I feel bad and I'm going to use a, use a behavior to feel better, right? There's more depth in being able to be that little detective like we talked about observe what's actually happening within you, that knowledge is very empowering. Take some time to have the courage to face it. But I promise you, if you can sit with the emotions, breathe through it, utilize those coping skills, discuss the emotions in therapy and in your sessions, your life can completely open up. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So Agreed. that's number two. Number two. What is number three, Meg? Number three... <laughs> thank you for that is and I see this one a lot and I think it's a little nuanced one some people might not even realize this is there but people don't want to recover because they don't want to face life and I have so much empathy and compassion for the people who are afraid to recover because they don't want to face life and to these individuals, life is a very vulnerable thing. And if they let their eating disorder go, you know, there is a wide world of potential to possibly fail in things that they care a lot about. So, you know, if you spend your life focusing on getting better, it's a very valiant pursuit, right? Like I am fighting. I am a fighter. I am sick. I am fighting, right? If you get better, then there's this vulnerability of, okay, so I need a career now and I need relationships. And maybe, you know, there are things I've missed out on that other people have developed in life that, you know, I have to sit here and recognize I don't have that. My heart goes out to folks who are in this position because it's a, it's a sticky one. You know, I think 
you know, this resistance is stemmed in a little bit of like wanting to avoid the expectations that people put on us in life. And, you know, when you are sick, those expectations aren't as high. So it's, it's an interesting one. I don't know. And Claire, what do you have to say about that? Of course, we're afraid. Mm -hmm. And I say, of course, because we're all going to fail. I mean, and that's the thing. And that's one of the scariest things is that when we go out there and we live life, we're going to hurt people. We're going to make mistakes. We're not going to get all the things that we we wanted to in the ways that we wanted to and the timings that we were hoping for. And that is scary. And of course, it can feel so much safer to stay stuck with, I'm working on healing, I'm working on my recovery. And that makes so much sense. It's, it's going to make so much sense if we've always been taught that feeling is bad. And that, you know, being a failure is the worst thing that could happen. Or if we've lived in a world where other people have always determined what the expectations are, and we've never been given the opportunity to define our own expectations. Mm. Like I often see it not only as, oh, there's the expectation of like maybe having a family, having a partner, having a career and whatever. But there's also the, you know, has anyone ever asked you what you wanted? And have you ever been given permission Mm -hmm. to define that for yourself? Mm -hmm. Because if that's not the case, then of course you're not going to want to go out there in the world because not only is it scary to have expectations on you, but that's not even what you want. Mm -hmm. So why would you even go out there and do it? Yeah, such a good point, Anne Claire. It's like these expectations that you are avoiding might not even be the expectations you put on yourself. It's other people putting these on, on your life. And if that's not what you want for your life, what's the motivation, right? To get better sometimes. And, and so it's a difficult place to be, but I love that point you had of just asking yourself, what do you want out of your life? You know, beyond this eating disorder. And And how can failing be supportive of where you're going? Like, I, I, like, I, I'm talking as a massive perfectionist over here, like learning how, you know, failing is part of the process and and self-compassion actually gets me further than judgment or not trying, right? Or not giving myself a go at doing certain things because at least I've got a chance of getting there or a chance of learning and then getting there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and maybe reviewing where I'm going and whatever, But again, like it's so understandable. And as it was the case for all of the other ones that we mentioned, naming it and being aware of it is going to be your first big step, if it's applicable to you, bring it into sessions Mm -hmm. with your treatment team. Mm -hmm. There is no one way to explore this. And it's so very personal. But if it's part of your inner resistance, it's going to be so key to explore it further and to start finding your way through the layers to meet yourself where you're at, right? Like we're not going immediately into doing something about it or fixing it or whatever. You deserve to be met where you are and to understand, you know, how come to then figure out, well, what do you want? And I just want to add here, like, my recovery taught me so much about failure. I was definitely a little bit of a perfectionist. And then, you know, recovery is such a a messy process (laughs) that you can't, it's impossible to do perfectly. So that was a really great way for me to practice coping with perceived failure, but really what it was. And I love this reframe. Failure is really an opportunity for feedback and for learning. And so I realized at a very young age that there is no reason to be afraid of failure because as long as you don't give up, you haven't failed. So if you keep going, if you try something new, if you, in in recovery, if you challenge something and it just turns out to be this like big mess, right? And it did not go the way you wanted it to. There's so much opportunity to say, okay, how can we do this a little bit differently? How can we 
change the situation so that I can improve the results, right? So failure is sometimes an invitation to do things a little better and to learn. I personally love that. You know, I don't think we look at, you know, failure with, we don't give failure enough credit. Everyone's so afraid of it. It's like, how about we just like recognize that it's a part of life and like, I mean, I get what you mean, but I'm still scared of failing. And I understand. And I, I still I, don't I, like it, but I can appreciate that it's a necessary and non-negotiable part of life. So I might as well accept it and work with it. <laughs> yeah. It's one of our greatest teachers. Like if you're not willing to show up and, and put yourself mm -hmm. out there and potentially fail, you're going to stay sheltered, you know? And so like, yeah, it's really scary. But if we can think of it in a different way, it is actually just like this huge growth point. And yeah, I, mean, I love I honest, that. Yeah. I honestly feel like to an extent, you know, in order to get past that, there's a, a piece of making sure that you know why you're showing up and why that's worth the failure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not going helpful. to try something and go outside of my comfort zone and my safety if the thing that I'm trying isn't worth the effort. <laughs> no. But if it is, then suddenly failing becomes the opportunity to learn. Yeah, it does. You know, and I'm not saying go out there and like, I don't want all of you, everyone to fail. And I would say, you know, embrace the smaller, smaller perceived failures. I don't want you to like fail at life in like all no, of course ways. not. But it's but realistic to say that everyone will. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in one way or another, everyone will. And, you know, I agree with you. Like we're not suggesting everyone should like just go ahead and fail at everything. And that's not that's not going to help you be motivated and show up for yourself and be committed to the process. But we'll talk about goal setting another time. <laughs> yeah. We will do that another time. And so there you have it. Three reasons why people don't really want to recover. And we're just saying they're valid reasons. We're not saying you shouldn't recover. So anyway, that's that. It, I'll just reiterate them. They are, I don't know who I am without it. I don't want to feel my emotions. And I don't want to face life in like a, in a vulnerable way. So there's that. I want to encourage everyone to please like and subscribe, comment, on this video so that you can stay in touch with us and stay connected to the channel. We thank you guys so much for watching today and for viewing. Love you guys. And Claire, thank you for being here. You're so thank you, Meg. You're the bomb.com. You are magnificent. <laughs> you are air conditioning. That's really cool. <laughs> and and I am pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Mwah! <laughs>